Welcome to the Arts and Culture episode of The Bright Side, where we shine a light on the real Michigan. I'm today's host, Marcus McKissick, and I'm coming to you from Rio Town, the historical commercial district in South Lansing. Rio Town was fashioned and envisioned by Ransom Eli Olds, and where auto factories used to roam, now there's a thriving commercial district that is reimagining itself through the graffiti works. Where I now stand is the former site of the Rio Town's Deluxe Inn, a seedy hotel that was home to crime and blight. But now, a year and a half after it's been demolished, stands this Rio Town sign, which is a symbol of the hope and prosperity of the entire region. In our first segment, we're gonna to go to Grand Rapids and visit the Avenue of the Arts. We're gonna take a swing by the Heartside Gallery where you can meet some unique local artists. Avenue for the Arts is the community that lives and works along South Division. As part of the Avenue for the Arts, we are involved in a lot of the activities that go on. So we're here during the arts market, during the urban lights events, and also in this space, um, two levels above us is the live workspaces for artists in the community. We're here at Heartside Ministry in our art studio and gallery, and that's on 54 South Division in Grand Rapids. A busy place. Uh, about six or seven years ago, you wouldn't have seen a lot of businesses along South Division. And so Dwelling Place started looking at the possibility of what can we do with these spaces, how can we bring people in, and they were struck by how many artists had been coming to them and asking for affordable studio spaces and places to live. Dwelling Place came up with a plan that would include live work spaces for artists. So we're going to go, we're going to stop in and we're going to check out this live work space. Well, we live here. We've been here for about nine months and um, we live in the back part of the space mm -hmm. and we play music in about the middle part of the space and then and the front part, we usually leave it clear and open and nice for um, art shows or music shows or any other kind of community event that somebody wants us to host. Grand Rapids to me feels like Everyone's just like, yeah, I'm excited about what you're doing, and um, I get excited about living here for that reason, really. All the art you see here is made by self-taught people. So we consider this a drop-in studio for folks who are in the Heartside neighborhood in one, uh, one way or another. So there are a fair amount of folks who um, might live in the neighborhood, um, single room occupancy or you know, regular apartments around. Um, some folks who are staying in the missions or at open door, maybe a degage. Um, some folks who are sleeping at you know, just other random places that might not be missions. Um, and so we just try to have it mostly be for the Heartside neighborhood. Well, why are we doing art for people that don't have any money? I mean, that seems like such a luxury. But first of all, we're people. We're human. Human beings are creative. It's a fundamental part of our nature. To be able to be creative is to express the gifts that God gave us and to create something, produce something, be affirmed in that, also find your own voice and be able to speak your own truth as to what their life experience is, which is every bit as valid as mine, or yours, or anybody that's had training about how you should really use perspective, or you should really, you know, make sure that the oceans are darker blue than the sky. When they're doing their art, they know that it has value, and it gives their life meaning. I can't think of a more important thing for us in terms of the work that we do. I came across this place, come in and thought, this is a good place to start my life. Tons. These are my pieces on the wall, these five. One is called prayer, the other one is called uh, 
apostle, apostles. That's called my family. The other one is our, and the other one is uh, seek and find. I never thought I could draw a stick man, let alone do art. But something happened to me where I figured it all out. And uh, if you like to see the, the picture, I'll show it to you. This is my latest picture. It's called the Eagle's Nest. It's kind of like about what we're all about at Heart Science, because we all look out for each other. The Museum of Everything in London discovered our gallery, contacted Sarah, wanted to see films of images of some of our artists. She did digital, sent them on off. And from there they picked two artists, so Mark Wilson was one of the artists and he um, passed away in 2008. Um, but I knew, I mean, we, I think everybody knew that in seeing Mark's artwork that at some point he would be discovered. And then the other artist is Willie Jones, so we have a lot of his work right now, and he's here working in the studio, comes in every day, and he draws hot rods. And I love drawing. What's your favorite thing to draw? Really, on cars, houses, yeah. I, I look at, the, at the, those people that come here, they are very talented and capable people. Just because they're kicked down to the curb doesn't mean that there's nothing that they can do. And a lot of the people that I associate with are really intelligent people. They just haven't had the chance to do what they could do. The people that we are with all the time are the most authentic human beings you will ever meet. And I think it's fair to say the whole staff believes it is our deep privilege to be here. In our next segment, we're going to go to an event that's right here in the capital city that highlights DJs and their artistry. This event is near and dear to my heart, and in a second, you'll see why. It's not just a one aspect DJ competition. So in a lot of DJ competitions, uh, you know, we want to see who can scratch the best. And you know, scratching is exciting, um, but it limits the amount of people that can participate and actually does not highlight the full versatility of a DJ. And so what the Capital City DJ Olympics does is you have to express yourself through mixing, so blending two different songs together and making it flawlessly sound like one song. We got the DJ Olympics tonight. We got Lance's top DJs rocking it out for the uh, championship for 2011. The guys that have put this together have been phenomenal in creating an environment so those DJs and the DJs that can promote themselves to, to all come together with all different genres, all different styles to do what they do best. Well, there's uh, a half a dozen DJs each night, and um, you know they get a they each get a 15 to 20 minute set to display their their talent. And you're gonna see all the different kinds of DJs, and you're gonna you're, yes you're gonna see your scratch DJ. Um, yes, you're gonna see the guy with the violin. Yes, you're gonna see um, you know house DJs, people playing you know underground music that you know you're just not familiar with. You're gonna hear people put together unique mashups of tracks that you just wouldn't think you know some '80s rock song with a with a hip hop beat behind it. And we've had people turn out to be kind of DJ snobs <laughs> yeah, yeah. from participating with the DJ Olympics. Just watching, you know, is that now when they go places, you know, they get a little upset if they see a guy that's just playing something off iTunes, you know, that they could do with their iPod, you know, they want to see somebody actually putting work into their craft. It's helping to resurrect the DJ. Being a DJ myself, it is such a rewarding feeling when you hear, like, when you drop that track. And 
Chicago's. Oh, you know, they're actually listening and responding. You know, somebody will come up, you know, give you, you know, pound. Man, that's my track. You know, oh my God, I haven't heard that in so long. Since we started the DJ Olympics, we have generated about sixty-eight thousand dollars that has stayed in the local community. When you're talking about getting a DJ, you're looking to make a memorable night. Now let's go out to Hastings, where you can see how art has transformed a small town into a cultural destination. There's lots of special things about Hastings. Obviously, I'm standing next to the sculpture. Uh, we have a great sculpture exhibit. This is our second annual year. It's turned into 20 sculptures, and they're within walking distance of the downtown. And you can walk from sculpture to sculpture and enjoying the vibrancy of our beautiful little downtown Hastings. So many people from all over have heard about our sculpture tour and came to visit. I mean, from the outlying cities, Kalamazoo, Battle Creek, Lansing, Grand Rapids, um, and other communities as well from Michigan. I had a lady who lives here in Hastings. She brings her two sisters every year. They, came, they come to visit every year, and they think it's great and, and walk around and have lunch. And So we're getting lots of exposure all over the state, so I think that's pretty exciting. say one of the favorites is the horse which is right behind you. That I love because of the fact it's when you get up close to it it's made up of all different kinds of pieces of metal like things that you would recognize. It's kind of neat to see those things and maybe some things that you'd see laying in a junkyard or you know different places that have no use anymore and now they do because they're part of the horse and his name is Gaze. Well, John Hart, our Director of Community Development here in Hastings, obviously is an art enthusiast. So that's where it all began, and he researched Midwest Sculpture Initiative, and that's how we began, is he got one sculpture from them. Midwest Sculpture Initiative comes here, and they show us a slideshow of different sculptures that the artists have submitted to him to be in the sculpture exhibit. We chose to have 10. You can choose the amount that you want, you have 15, 20, but we chose 10. So what happens is those art enthusiasts and the artists and um, actually different artists we have in town, art teachers, other community members, come on that day and then there's a vote about which 10 that we will have downtown. So it's not chosen by John or I, it's chosen by the community of which ones they would really like to have in our downtown. And as you can see, um, when you walk through downtown, there's a different variety of art here. Things that kids and adults both enjoy. Business professionals, real estate developers, marketers throughout the state, and within the region, as well as our community members, view the installation of the sculptures for what they are, art, a community, and economic development strategy. It's been pretty fantastic. In our next segment, we're gonna go out to the Mosaic Youth Theater in Detroit, where we find out how theater is not only entertainment, but it transforms lives. I'm building me a home. 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 This earthly house. It's not just a place. It's not just a theater company. It's very much a family. It's very much the people that make it up. And just as in a regular mosaic, you have each individual piece that could stand on its own as a work of art. But when you put them all together, it feeds into something so much bigger than us all. We really saw there was a lot of potential in the city. There were a lot of young, really talented people who didn't have any opportunity in school or any place else to do theater. And my 
pastor's got a hand. Yeah, my soul's got a hand. A group of young people who were totally committed. We did with very little or no money, but it was based on the kids and their energy. We started out wanting to do theater. You know, hey kids, let's put on a play. We started out with a bunch of really talented singers that we wanted to have people hear them sing. What we learned along the way, that a lot of different cultures came together, and that everything was done as a group, that the young artists had as much input as we did, that the material that we produced on stage was their voices as much as they were ours. It was the culture of the young artists that we were putting out there on stage. Within the past few years, we've helped over a thousand young artists throughout the metro Detroit area pursue their dreams. The people who are here still have something to say, and the way that these young artists are able to say it is through their art. There is so much more uh, that we can do, just given the time and the opportunity. I just bursted out into tears because I couldn't believe we had this fantastic facility with our own black box that had our name on it and Mosaic Singers finally had their own room where they could practice. It's just incredible to see what it used to be and what it is now and I'm, I'm really excited for what the future holds. Going through this program, it has been very clear what Mosaic stands for with regards to professionalism, how you present yourself in public, with regards to how you treat the people around you. I don't really believe I would be inspired to follow my goals or my aspirations that I want to or that I wanted to as growing up. I think Mosaic gives you that outlet to explore possibilities. As a person, Mosaic has always represented a place that I can call family. I remember feeling this incredible sense of being a part of something really big, a part of something really special. As an artist, it taught me so much that translated into my work in college and afterwards. It's changing lives by opening up minds and worlds. Cause we all need somebody to lean on. I just might have a problem. Where I see Mosaic in the future, there's always going to be young artists who need a place we need a place to come together and express their art. And I think that there's always going to be a market for that. There's always going to be people who are interested in seeing that and experiencing that. But I know that the need will always be there. The sky is the limits for Mosaic. It's nothing that Mosaic couldn't accomplish. What I would like to see is it to go so far that everyone in the United States knows who Mosaic Youth Theater of Detroit is. Those of your needs that you won't let so lean on me. Especially in times like now, in terms of the economic situation in, in the country and in the world and in the city, art is fluff. Art is frivolous. Art is something that we will have money for after we pay for all the other basic needs. Art is a basic need, and I guess that's the one thing I would want to say. It's not something extra if we get a chance. It is a basic need just like air and food and drink and shelter. My name is Courtney Smith and I'm in the acting company at Mosaic Youth Theater of Detroit. If I wasn't in Mosaic, I think that I would have dropped out of school. I don't think that I would be this close to college because I wouldn't have an outlet. Like before I joined Mosaic, I was very quiet and angry, just young and angry. Joining Mosaic, opened me up. It has changed me for the better. Walking hand in hand together. Now let's stop by ArtServe Michigan and find out how some communities are using art as an economic development tool. Hi, welcome to the 411. I'm Tiffany Lemieux McKissick and we're here today with Cezanne Charles from ArtServe Michigan. How are you doing, Cezanne? I'm doing well. Great. 
So can you tell us a little bit about ArtServe and what you guys are doing? Sure. ArtServe Michigan is a statewide arts advocacy and capacity building organization. And what that really means is we try and provide advocacy as well as support and connections to the creative industries within Michigan. So our advocacy work is really focused um, a couple fold. It's really in terms of making sure that there's a voice in Lansing as well as a voice in, Mich in Washington looking after Michigan's interest in the arts and creative communities. So you feel like art is a really effective economic development strategy? I do. I mean, there's all of the kind of, you know, um, what we think of in terms of intrinsic kind of ways that art is powerful in terms of economic development from kind of, you know, the stats that we see consistently from things like the Ann Arbor Art Fair, you know, that are bringing people into town to some of the stats that are coming out about filmmaking. And those are like intrinsic, those are actual, those are, we can kind of, you know, verify them through statistically relevant means. Um, but then there's all of the other ways that um, the arts are a powerful incubator for people. They're a powerful message for people. I sort of think about the ads, you know, for, you know, Chrysler, of all things. Um, but when I see that ad, I see music, you know, that is from here. I see a sense of place that's from here. They're showing off our public art and, that, you know, they're talking about something that is intangible that kind of flows through Michigan, you know, and and they're using art as a medium to kind of tell that story even in a 30 second spot. So what kind of art do you do? So I work in art and technology. I'm both left and right, and <laughs> maybe center brained or something. Um, but so my work takes a lot of different forms, but it normally um, involves some form of um, interactive technology. So I tend to work with a lot of sensor-based stuff. I build robots yeah. <laughs> as art. Um, I'm really engaged in kind of rethinking design mm -hmm. um, as part of as part of kind of um, where I see our culture heading in terms of, you know, just kind of consumer um, awareness about how to create more sustainable uh, products. And so we do it through fictionalized robotic design. So if someone wants to get involved or find out more about Arts for Michigan, where can they go? They can go to www.artsofmichigan.org. You can also find out more about Creative Impact Michigan by going to creativeimpactmichigan.com. And that's our e-magazine, and I highly recommend everybody sign up for that. And through our individual artist work, you can find us um, on Facebook at, at facebook.com, the creative mini. So, okay. That's where you can find out most about us. Thank you so much, Suzanne, yes. for, <laughs> for doing the interview. And, um, and thank you for watching. This is the 411. We've been all over Michigan, and we've seen all different types of artists. But now we're going to literally watch artists who turn trash into treasure. Come with us as we go to Lansing's Old Town for Scrap Fest. I'm Olivia Courant, and this is Fun in Five. I'm standing outside the Freeland Industries scrapyard in Lansing with a question. What do you do with all of this junk? You make art, of course. Here in Lansing, the Old Town Commercial Association hosts Scrap Fest, an event where teams of artists get one hour to collect up to 500 pounds of scrap metal from the Freeland scrapyard. The artists then have two weeks to take what they collected and turn it into a sculpture. Today, we'll look at how last year's sculptures were made, and then we'll take a tour of some of this year's amazing and useful sculptures at Festival of the Moon in Old Town. We do have a plan. We thumbnailed it out, we had an idea, and a couple of um, ways to do it, depending on what we found, so we kind of planned it out. It's just finding the metal that matches our plan, so doing okay so far. It's a little bit hard to be the one watching and not out there, but I think they're doing okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the, the collection that I've accumulated and make an assessment over the next couple of days and see what happens. <laughs> Just 
it's coming out so much like the drawings is kind of scary because you know, we went to the junkyard and we seen everything in there and it's just there's nothing exactly we could put together in our mind but once we got it back here started putting all our minds together we got a great idea for what we want to go with and everything's come together really well the team's getting along great is it it's been a really fun experience still need some eyes. What I do is I uh, look at different shapes, like uh, for instance, angle iron for the face and the head. And you can see it more clearly on the gentleman here. Uh, you can see the angle and another piece of metal. They just bend around and weld and form and heat and bend and twist and bang with a hammer and we end up with the shapes we want. So at the Scrap Fest, people get to vote for their favorite sculptures, and it seems like it might be kind of hard to choose this year. You can put cold drinks here. Wine glasses here, candles and other accessories up on the table. This sculpture is one of my favorites because it's a bike and it actually works. Current, and this has been fun in five, four, three, two, one. It was Ernest Levy that said that man will recover when he values art as much as he does physics, chemistry, or money. Thank you for joining us here on The Bright Side. My name is Mark Spikisic. I've been glad to be your host. You can share your stories at brightsidetv.com. Thank you and have a great day. I'm Olivia Crunt and this is Fun in Five. Today we're standing outside. <laughs> I'm Olivia Crunt and this is Fun in Five. Microphone check, mic microphone check, uh, microphone check, mic microphone check. Uh, you sing for the interview too. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was Ernest Levy that said that man will recover when he values money. <laughs> <laughs>